the confession then has this um, magnificent conclusion. Which doctrine of the Trinity is the foundation of all our communion with God and comfortable dependence on Him? <laughs> now, I want to tell you a historical fact, and I want you to, to make a conclusion. That phrase, let me read it again, which doctrine of the Trinity is the foundation of all our communion with God and comfortable dependence on Him. That last sentence is not in the Westminster Confession of Faith. But it is in the Savoy Declaration of Faith. If you know the Savoy Declaration of Faith you will know that that was the Congregationalist's confession, right? Westminster Confession was the Presbyterian Confession. The Savoy Declaration was the Congregationalist's Confession. And who were the two leading Congregationalists of their day that had their hand in the Savoy Declaration? John Owen and Thomas Goodwin. And John Owen happened to write a little book called On Communion with God, in which he unfolds the absolutely marvelous redemptive benefit of a child of God being able to have communion with the Father and with the Son and with the Holy Spirit. In fact, that book of Owen, there's so much that Owen wrote that's just absolutely valuable, right? I would say that if all of Owen's works were to go up in flames, <laughs> which would be an absolute tragedy, some of you would grab volume six of the mortification of sin. Okay? Some of you would grab volume 10 on, on limited atonement and perseverance. I would grab the volume on communion with God. Nothing has fed my soul like that. I mean, who but a Puritan would actually work on how to have communion with each member of the triune Godhead? So my suspicion is that this last phrase taken from the Savoy Declaration, that it gets into the Savoy Declaration because of the influence of the Prince of Puritans, John Owen. Okay. But what does it mean? This last sentence actually unfolds for us what we could call the Trinitarian Christian life. There is, so, so you know, we just, we just went over some unbelievably uh, heady things, right? I mean, some, some things that, you know, subsistences and persons and essence and, and, and all of that. And there's a sense where as you start to, to think about the Trinity, you, you feel like, like you are wading in way over our heads. But don't forget that knowing the triune God has incredibly rich devotional benefit in our lives. Think about your redemption like this. God, who is absolutely and perfectly satisfied in himself, enjoying the fullness of himself and his own love in the persons of the Trinity... 
So Augustine actually describes the Trinity like this, is that the Father is the lover and the Son is the beloved and the Spirit is the bond of love between the lover and the beloved. And Edwards would actually have a, a, a quite a similar type explanation of the triune Godhead. But here is this picture of, of Trinitarian blessedness that goes back forever. There never was a time where God was lonely. He was always in the fullness of society within the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And it is that very triune fellowship and very triune blessedness that those who are in Christ are brought into that. Father, I pray that you would love them with the love that you loved me before the foundation of the world. To to be in union with Christ is to be in fellowship with the triune Godhead. It is to have a relationship with the one true and living God and yet to know him as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so the Christian life is Trinitarian. Our salvation is work of the Trinity, is it not? <laughs> Remember Spurgeon, it takes the whole Trinity to save somebody. Okay. If you want to put it real simply, Ephesians 1, the Father chooses, the Son redeems, the Spirit applies the benefits of redemption as the seal given to us, right? And so you see that salvation, which is Trinitarian, and you begin to then appreciate each dimension of your salvation from a Trinitarian perspective. Oh, to be loved by the Father, to be prayed for by Jesus Christ, to be filled with the Holy Spirit who points us to Jesus. You also have baptism. So many of us take this for granted. When you professed your faith in the waters of baptism, you were baptized into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We don't typically think too much about that. To be baptized into the name of the triune God. Our prayer life is Trinitarian, right? This is Ephesians 2, 18, not 19, as it says in your notes. We are to come to God through Christ in the Spirit. That's how we come to God. And so those who are saved are called into communion with the Trinity. And so Paul's benediction is may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Brothers, what that means is not only should we intentionally and actively seek communion with the triune God in full appreciation for what the Father and the Son and the Spirit do for us. I mean, just, just ferret those things out in your own mind of, of the distinctive work of each member of the Trinity. But what this also means is that our worship in our churches should be fully Trinitarian. We should not so order our worship services that people think that the only one we care about is the Father. Or the only one we talk about is Jesus. Or the only one we are concerned about is the Holy Spirit. By the way, do you do see those trends in, in, in churches, don't you? Right? Specialize in the Spirit, specialize in Jesus, specialize in the Father. We should specialize in the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Our worship should be conscientiously Trinitarian to the praise of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. If you are a pastor, your prayers should be infused with Trinitarianism. You should not have visitors leave your church wondering what you believed about the Trinity. That means that you sing it. It means that you pray it. And our theology should be robustly Trinitarian. And so Peter Toon, Anglican with a wonderful book on the Trinity, 
says, What greater joy can a theologian have than to contemplate the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, his Son, by the illumination and inspiration of the Holy Spirit? What greater privilege can a theologian have than to seek to expound the doctrine of the mystery of the blessed, holy, and undivided Trinity, God blessed forever and unto the ages, is not the chief end of man to enjoy and glorify God forever. Amen. Well, let's pray.